Well, good morning. good morning. Hey, welcome home to Cassidy. My name is Stephen Mitchell, and it's a great joy to be here with you, to be able to celebrate all that God continues to do in and through us, that God allows us to partner with Him, to do cool things alongside Him, that we can let the Holy Spirit move us into love and grace and share that hope uh, that we have found in Jesus with everyone we encounter. So if you are new here, first, we just want to say you're welcome here. Whether you're joining us online or in person for the very first time, uh, we, we just want you to feel welcomed and to know that we realize that we aren't perfect, but we know the one who is, and that's Jesus Christ. And so we want to invite you on a journey with us, that together we can grow in relationship with God and relationship with one another so that we can go into the world, meeting people where they are and sharing love and grace with each and every person we encounter. Uh, Over the course of the last year, we have been on a journey called One. Uh, One, if you are are new here, you're going to be like, okay, I have no idea what's going on, but I'm going to explain it. It's good. Um, If you'll notice when you leave the sanctuary or when you're driving by on Fremont, or if you've looked at our cool sign, uh, it says One on it with a period at the end of it. That is 99 white dots followed by one orange dot because Jesus said, I'm going to leave the 99 safe and sound, and then I'm going to go after the one. And we said, hey, we want to do the same thing, Lord, so help us to do that. And so we put up a sign that is truly our scoreboard, our scoreboard saying over the course of the year, we wanted to do 100 things to make a difference for the kingdom of God. We wanted to love Jesus and do something about it. And so those 100 things were people that were baptized or people that uh, became uh, members or people that said, hey, I want to be a part of what Jesus is doing. I want to volunteer. Or uh, we, we built three houses in, uh, in Juarez, Mexico, uh, instead of, uh, of, well, actually we built four. We paid for three, but then they, God did a, a miraculous thing. And so a fourth house got built uh, for folks that were living in cardboard boxes. And for each one of those things, we lit a light bulb. And, and we wanted to celebrate all that God had done through us, not because we want to pat ourselves on the back, but we want to be like, look at God go. God did something miraculous through this ragtag group of people and said, hey, I I can do greater things through you so that you can go into the world and make a difference. And that's what we've been doing for a year. And and, and now at the end of that, we, we celebrated a couple of weeks ago and we said, yeah, we did it, but now we're going to go and do it again. Uh, And the whole idea is, it's not, we didn't cross a finish line, we crossed the starting line. And we said, now all the warm-up is done, let's let's get to it. And we started last, or two weeks ago by saying, hey, we need to welcome one another in Jesus. We we said that uh, if you get here and you're like, man, it used to be a lot smaller and I was more happy when it was smaller and everybody knew my name, first, get to know people's names. Go say hi to them. Second, realize that we made room for you first. You didn't mind it when we made room for you. Now we're making room for others so that others can come into relationship. And then we said, we want to encourage one another to lift one another up, to bear each other's burdens so that we're not going through this thing called life by ourselves, but we're going through it as a community of faith saying, Jesus is doing something powerful, and we're going to share life with one another, we're going to do life with one another, and then we're going to go in the world and show them just what, how crazy Jesus' love is and how we can be a part of their lives so that they can come and fall in love, with you, not because they come here, but so that they can fall in love with Jesus Christ and, and, and take a step toward Jesus. And this week, this week we're going to talk about a thing called restoration. Restoration is key in the whole mindset of the Bible. Being restored to God, being restored to community, being restored in in the personhood that we have in Jesus, that's what it's all about. Uh, And and Jesus says, I want to make you whole, not I want to give you a little bit of an okay life, but instead I want to give you a brand new life so that you can be made whole in Jesus, so that the wholeness that you find in Christ is something that you can live into. And we do that through restoration, that God restores us. Uh, I know a little bit about restoration. When I was 18, I know for some of you uh, that, that know me, 
you're not going to find this hard to believe at all. Uh, for, for those of you that are new here, uh, I used to be a bonehead. Uh, I'm still a bonehead a lot of the time, but I used to really, like I was a professional. Uh, when I was 18 years old, I went to my dad and I was like, I'm moving out. I got a job at the kite store in the mall. My, my long-term plan, <laughs> it was very short-term. Uh, turns out I was an idiot, uh, but, but I thought I knew what was going on. I, like, I, I, seriously, I told I'm moving out. I, I packed my stuff in a duffel bag, and I moved. Uh, so a buddy of mine and his friend had an apartment, and it was the three of us. We were like living high on the hog, uh, and then while I was working at that kite shop in the mall, I got a phone call, uh, and 18-year-old Steve got his first pink slip. Um, he said, hey, I, I, I'm moving the kite shop to Galveston, which I lived in Houston, Texas. Galveston is not in Houston, um, and it was about an hour away, and he didn't say, hey, do you want to come to Galveston and be my kite shop salesman? Uh, no, he said, I'm, I'm closing the, the store down. So here's what I want you to do. First, the toilet's plunged. Please go fix that. And I was like, oh, great. Now I got to unclog a toilet before I get paid. Undid that and then shut the doors and throw the keys through the doors. We're closed. We're done. And so I was like, okay, well, maybe I could find another job. And so I started looking around for other jobs in the mall because that was the place to work at that point in time if you were 18. And oddly enough, having kite store references is not really the best way to get another another job. Nobody's like, oh yeah, you worked at the kite store? Oh my gosh, come on in. You could sell anything, although they should have, uh, but that's not where it was. Uh, and so my, my, my world started shrinking, and I, I didn't have the money to pay for rent, and rent was coming due, and so I went to my roommates, and I said, hey guys, we have a little bit of a problem, and they said, hey guy, perhaps now is the time for you to move out. Now, good news, I, my name wasn't on the, on the lease, but I've been living there, and now, now I was finding that I was going to be homeless. And at, at 18, I was like, this is not a desirable state. I don't know a lot of girls that are like, hey, where do you live? And you're like, I live on the streets. And they're like, all right, well, let's go hang out sometime. Uh, and that was my primary focus in life at that point. And so I was just kind of out, and I, I said, okay, here's what I got to do. I got to go talk to my parents and see if they will let me move back home. Uh, and, and when I talked to my dad, he was like, we can have a conversation, <laughs> which, is, which is parental code for uh, you have wronged us, and now we need to make some, um, some rules and some adjustments before you come home. Uh, and so I, I, I got that we need to talk first conversation, and I realized that my actions and my words had put me in a precarious place. That now, I didn't know where I was going to stay, and if my mom and dad said, no, you can't come home, which, honestly, they never were going to say that, but I sure felt like they could. Uh, and I went, to, and I had a conversation with my dad and my mom, and I said, hey, I'm sorry, uh, I'm, I'm a bonehead. <laughs> See, it's good. Sometimes it's just good to say that. Um, but I, I, I explained to them, you know, that, that I had plans to go into the military and that this would just be short term. And my dad was like, okay, no problem. You can come back. He allowed me to be restored to the family, even though by my actions and my words, I had hurt my mom and dad greatly. Uh, I, I had made them feel like I didn't care if they were alive or not. I, I left with the intent of throwing things. I'll be right back. I <laughs> First time for everything. Um, <laughs> who knew? If you're, not, if you're not in person, I just threw the clicker that does the next slide. It's great. Um, but I, I, I left with the intent of, of being out on my own, and I, I didn't need anybody. And the reality of I needed people, I had to go back and swallow some of my pride and, and talk to my parents and, and seek their forgiveness, their grace, so that I could be restored so that I could have a place to live. Uh, now, some of us have felt that way. Some of us have, have dealt with restoration in this way, that, that we needed to be restored, that we had wronged someone uh, in our family. We treated them poorly, or we said things that were hurtful, or, or it was a friend or a, a, a spouse 
that we have treated that way. And for some of us, we've been on the other side of that, where we've had someone that has hurt us. We've had someone that has treated us bad, whether family or friend or spouse, and we had to find a way to allow for restoration to occur. And and the reality is restoration is powerful. Restoration is powerful because the person being restored can see themselves in a different light than they ever have before. Maybe they can start to see themselves in a way that they uh, did not understand themselves before. They, they realize, hey, they can't do this all on their own because 18 and a kite shop worker is not a great plan for success. And so we can look at this and we can see the value in it. And we can understand that. And actually, the definition of restoration, for those of us who don't know, is the act of returning something to former original, normal, or unimpaired condition. It returns something to the way that it should be. And, and that's the whole idea that we have in this, this topic today, because you can restore a great many things. I mean, you can restore cars. Uh, I, I think that's fascinating when people get old, junky cars, and they make them uh, into something amazing, and it's a restored piece of equipment. Uh, you can restore relationships. You can restore houses so that you can sell them, flip them and sell them. That's, that's every home and garden TV show right there. Um, And you can restore people. There's so many things that can be restored. And what's interesting is that God is all about restoration. This was one of the key things that Jesus' ministry here reveals to us. Because Jesus didn't just try to restore the relationship people had with God. He did that for sure. But he also was seeking for people to be restored in community together so that they could be returned into community, so that they could thrive in the community that they needed to be in and that needed them to be a part of it. In Luke's gospel, we see a story of a guy that had leprosy. It says this, while Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. While he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Then Jesus ordered him, don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Jesus heals this guy and sends him to the priest to to be proclaimed clean. And the reality is being a leper in the time of Jesus, it it was really not okay. It was harsh because the law said you had to leave until you were clean. You couldn't stay in community. Uh, And the law commanded that anyone with a skin disease, they called leprosy. It's not the same leprosy that we have in our head, uh, but it could be a rash that's there. It could be eczema. It could be dry skin. Whatever it is, as long as it was there and visible, you were considered unclean. And, and, and we've talked about this before, but my favorite way to describe cleanliness uh, in the mindset of the Jews is cooties. Do you remember when you were a kid, uh, maybe some of you, I don't know if they they even do cooties anymore, probably not because it's lame, Uh, but if you had cooties, all you had to do was touch somebody and then they had cooties too and cooties just spread rampantly throughout the fifth grade class I was in, probably kindergarten actually, Uh, come to think of it. Uh, Anyway, uh, this was the mindset of cleanliness in, in the time of Jesus. If someone was declared unclean, if they came in contact with someone who was clean, now they were unclean. And if they came in contact with someone who was unclean, they became, uh, are clean, they became unclean. And the command, the law commanded anyone that had a skin disease, leprosy, had to isolate themselves. 
And, and the Old Testament in the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, um, this is where the law comes from, where we see this written in Leviticus. It says this, anyone with such a defiling disease, anyone with leprosy, anyone with a skin disease that's visible must wear torn clothes, let their hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of their face and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside the camp. They're excluded from community. So imagine, if you will, what that must have been like. Uh, removed from your family, from your friends, from your, your kiddos, and from everyone that you knew. And you had to walk around, uh, walk around and let everybody know. You know, you were excluded, but then on top of it, you had to have your hair unkempt. I'd be okay with that part. Uh, you had to tear your clothes and, and wear torn clothes, and you had to walk around yelling, unclean, unclean. Why? So that everybody else could get away from you so that they didn't catch the cooties. And this was the reality. And if you think about it, this has got to be awful because now you're that person, the one that nobody wants to talk to, the one that nobody wants to deal with, the one that walks down the street talking to themselves in a very loud and agitated way, right? And everybody looks and they're like, oh, we can't be a part of that. That's, that's the weird one. That's the one that's unclean. That's the one that if they touch me, then I'm unclean. So when the guy goes to Jesus and he says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. The first contact that he's had since he's had this disease, and it says he was covered up with leprosy. Jesus breaks all the conventions. Jesus says, I don't, I don't care about the rules. I care about you. And so he reaches out his hand and grabs hold of him and says, I am willing, be clean. And the leprosy left him. And then what does he do? He doesn't say, come hang out with us. He doesn't say, hey, we'd love to have you join us for the band of merry men that I'm creating. No, Jesus says, go to the chief priests and be declared clean. Why? So that then he can go back to his family, so that he can be restored to his community because he needs his community and his community needs him. And so that's why he is sent back. He's sent back by Jesus to go and de be declared clean so that the chief priest can say, yes, you're good to go. You can go back to your family. You can go back to your community. This is one of the key things. We, we read the stories of Jesus and, and we just pass right by that. He does this so frequently. People that are separated from community for one reason or another, whether it's because they were sick and couldn't do that because they had leprosy or, or the woman that was subject to bleeding or the woman that was caught in adultery or the woman who was sinful and yet met with Jesus at the well. The reality is, Jesus was more concerned with restoring people than condemning them. And I think we have a little bit to learn so that we can be more like Jesus, so that we can love people where they are, share his love and grace with them, regardless of who they are and what they're done, regardless of their political views, regardless of their human sexuality views, regardless of whatever it is, because Jesus says, I love them no matter what. And I want you to love them too. And if you find them to be an enemy, Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus is all about restoration, and yet we find good reasons why we should put barriers to keep people out. Jesus seeks to restore people in two ways. Jesus wants to restore people's relationship with God the Father, and Jesus wants to restore people into community. In, in the relationship with his Father, through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we are restored and given grace. Why? So that we can be the people that God has intended us to be from the beginning. So that we can be not just forgiven, but justified and made pure as the, uh, as the whitest snow. 
to made, be made in the right relationship with God. 2 Corinthians, a, a letter Paul wrote to the church in Corinth says this, all this is from God, all this, this restoration, this act that Jesus has done, his life, death, and resurrection, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that he reconciled us and then gives us this as a job description, that this is the ministry that we have going forward, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that we, in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now here's the thing, this isn't saying, hey, the water's fine, come on in, and you can do whatever you want, no matter what you want. It says, love them where they are. Love Jesus, do something about it. Share that with other people. Share love and grace. Invite them into relationship. Invite them into the life of Christ, and I will, by my Holy Spirit, work in and through them to make them into the people that I want them to be. It's not that we want you to be where you need to be before you come in. No, we all need to come in and be restored into relationship. We need to be restored and reconciled to God so that we can carry on the message of Christ's re reconciling mission to the world. Not barring entry for, uh, from, uh, for others to come in, but instead inviting others to join us. Uh, have, you ever, have you ever taken a moment? Now, I grew up outside of the church, so I'm sure my list is much longer. But I, when I became Christian, I was like 26 years old. Uh, and I decided I was going to undertake the mission of writing down all the things I'd ever done wrong, all the sins I'd ever committed. Um, if, you've, if you've got some free time, give this a shot. Just, just, you know, even just in the last year, just give that a shot. What I did is I had four pages that were four columns wide, and they were all the way full, and my hand got tired, and I was like, well, crud, I've done a lot of bad stuff. Uh, I wasn't even scratching the surface. Uh, and I say this not so that you're back there and you're like, man, I, I've been a really, really bad person. I say this not so that you're depressed, but so that you can realize just how much Jesus has done for you. Just how far Jesus went to share love and grace with you. Just how much your life matters to Jesus. Because I promise you, if you were the only one who had turned away, Jesus would have come for you. And so in that, we recognize that we have received a radical amount of grace from God. And instead of hoarding that grace, we want to share that grace with others. Jesus says we should give grace just like we've received it. There's a, a parable in the New Testament that Jesus gives uh, about an unforgiving debtor. Uh, so this guy owes a king a, a large sum of money. Think millions of dollars. We'll just throw it out there. Maybe a billion. He owes, just for fun, let's throw it out there. He can't repay him no matter what. And the king calls his money due, and he takes the guy in front of him, and he says, you can't pay me, so I'm going to have your house sold, your household members put in slavery, and you're going to go to jail. And the guy falls on his face and says, Please forgive me. I'll make it up to you somehow. I'll, 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 I'll do better. All the things that we would say if we were in such a situation. And what happens is the king shows him grace. He says, you know what? I'll forgive your debt. You're, you're good. No problem. And what does he do? He takes that grace that he has received, that mercy that the king has given him, and he carries it out of the court feeling much better about himself because now he's been forgiven this massive debt and he sees somebody who owes him like 50 bucks. I'm just making up the numbers now, guys. Sees him and he says, hey, you owe me 50 bucks. Either pay me or I'm going to have you beaten and put in jail. <laughs> I mean, 
He, he's just received grace, and instead of sharing that, he goes and calls that guy out. And what happens? The king finds out about it, and the king is none too happy. And he reverses his judgment. And so Jesus is saying, hey, you've received grace. Don't, don't hold on to that. He, he's been given a, a huge break, and instead of responding in love and grace, he hoards the grace that he's been given. And he demands others do things that he couldn't do himself. Uh, just in theological terms, this guy was a huge jerk. We don't want to be like that. That's actually, you, you have to pay good money so that you can say that about people. That's good. It's good. Um, he wouldn't share it with others. You can do better than that. I can do better than that. We as a community can do better than that. So how do we do that? What does that look like? What do we do in order to start making that, that difference instead of uh, cutting people off to build bridges, instead of making barriers to, to make roadways and inways and, and avenues to find grace? What do we do? First, I think this is our number one problem. Don't set expectations, either inside or outside the church. Here's what I mean. So many problems in our world are because we hold others to a level that we ourselves don't want to go to. We expect others to behave in a specific way, to say things in a specific way, even though we ourselves wouldn't hold ourselves. That was a lot of ourselves in that. We wouldn't hold ourselves to that level. Why? Because it's too hard to be that good. Surely they should be that good, and I will give myself grace when I am not the same way. Uh, we set expectations, and what that does is that sets us up for failure. We expect, and we do this with family, with friends, with everybody, we have unspoken expectations that they will behave or do or, or be in a specific way. Just drive down the highway. When somebody cuts you off, that's your unspoken expectation, because you're like, what? Oh, you could have killed me. And they're just driving down the road. Like they, maybe they really got to go to the potty. I don't know. Uh, but it's that, that picture, right? Uh, we, we have to understand that we put these expectations out there. And when people don't measure up, we get mad. And Jesus says, hey, everybody's broken. Everybody's flawed. That's why I came here, so that they might find life. Not because they have it on their own, because they've, they've done away with what they had. Second thing is this, listen to what people have to say. Listen to them. Start, start listening because hearing someone can change things. Have you, ever, have you ever thought one scenario was going on and then you hear from the person that you're upset with or angry with or frustrated with and you find out the reason why they behaved in the way they did or said the things that they did or felt the way that they did? only to have yourself, or maybe this is just me because I talk too much, but you recognize, you know, I need to do something differently because I, here I was putting all of this on them and I was partly at fault here myself. So listen, because sometimes that changes everything. And then crazy, offer forgiveness and grace. Offer forgiveness and grace to others. And you don't have to do this by going, I offer you forgiveness and grace. How awkward is that? And do this by living fully into this relationship with Jesus and saying, hey, I'm going to love you no matter what you've done. Now, this does not mean that we just are, are codependent enablers, right? We're not just saying, hey, you can do whatever you want and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it. No, it means I'm going to love you regardless, which sometimes means you shouldn't be saying you shouldn't do that. I mean, when we love our kids, we don't say, hey, go climb whatever telephone pole you want to. Good luck, buddy. My son would have really liked that. Uh, instead, we, we correct. We, we, as a community, say, hey, we should live differently. We should be separate. We should be not separate, set apart. We should be holy like Jesus is holy so that we can love people the way that they are, so that we can live the way that Jesus wants us to, so that we can invite others into relationship. And then finally, not finally, but another step is be an agent of God's restoration to the world. He says we should be in the ministry of reconciliation, ambassadors for Christ. 
That's, that's our job. That's what we do. We love people. And the, the church is the only organism on earth that exists solely for the people outside of it. Because we are here so that we can share Jesus' love and grace with others. Be a part of the solution. Stop being a part of the problem. And I'm not saying that just to you. I'm saying that to me as well. And then finally, when in doubt and at all times, pray. Maybe you're sitting out there and through the course of this, you're like, yes, but you don't know my cousin or my uncle or my neighbor or my friend or my spouse. Hopefully that's not the case. If that's the case and you're struggling with someone in particular or some group of people in particular, then I advise this. You want to change that? Do this. God, I can't love them. Love them through me. You pray that to God and things will change. Why? Because it changes the focus. Then you start to rely on God's love to go through you to whoever it is that's causing such problem in your life. Um, And I've seen it work for me when I couldn't handle being around, near, or in the presence of someone um, that I pray, God, I I hate them. You're going to have to do something different in me so that I don't hate them anymore. And that's what God does. Because God says, yes, I'll do that because you need restoration. They need restoration too, but you also need to be restored to relationship with the Father. And this isn't easy. But God says, I got you. Not only will I give you the example through my life, death, and resurrection as Jesus, but instead I will send to you my Holy Spirit so that you can come to life in Jesus. And we can become more like Jesus, because Jesus is with us, not just at a distance, not just coaching us, but instead in us, shifting our perception so that we can be more like him. And we can make a difference for God's kingdom by helping to restore others, to share love and grace, to not hoard it, but instead to to let it pour out an overflow from the grace that God has given to us. And we can start right now. We don't have to wait for some future date. We don't have to wait for Jesus to come back to be people like Jesus. We can say, God, do this in me right now. Fill me up, change me, transform me so that I can love others with the same love that you have for me. We can do this because Jesus says, I love you and I give you my spirit. So let's do that. Let's live boldly for the kingdom of God. Let's love boldly and let's love Jesus and do something about it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Holy One, we need you. Mostly because this is not a sermon for them. This is a sermon for us, that we all need more of your grace so that we can fall in love head over heels with you, so that we can live boldly for you, so that we can go into your world sharing love and grace. God, pour your Holy Spirit out upon us, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we are made more and more into the image of Jesus Christ, that we can truly be ambassadors for Jesus, sharing love and grace, sharing hope and life, so that we can be restored to you and we can help others to be restored into that relationship as well. God, we pray this in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And all of us agreed and said, Amen.